Hey, what up all my tooth doctors and doctresses? Welcome to another video at the Tooth Factory. Today we're going to be continuing our dental pharmacology series with the CNS stimulants and a part of drug of abuse. Dr. Kananchar has put together an amazing presentation for us and I, Rishi, will be presenting them to you. Now, as you can see, the pictures up here indicate alcohol and cocaine per se, drugs in other ways that are of abuse, however, their effects on the central nervous system are variant. So we'll take a look at how that works with general CNS overview as always, general CNS uh, nervous system overview, and then we'll look at the psychomotor stimulants in depth, so the classification, their actions and effects and so on, and then hallucinogens as well as drug of abuse in depth followed by references. This picture here is the Drug Schedule Classifications of Pyramid. It holds five different schedules. By schedules, we mean how severe something needs to be monitored. So basically, by the use of this pyramid, the Schedule 5 is the most lenient of them, such as, for example, the cough preparations that contain not more than 200 milligrams of codeine per 100 milliliters or per 100 grams of the actual drug. However, the Schedule 1 drug over here is, you know, drugs such as heroin or LSD or marijuana, for example. And remember, marijuana is now legal in Canada for a while, and it's still a Schedule 1 drug. So it is a very, very potent, very harmful if misused. Again, it is not drug of use, it is abuse. Okay, so as we know, the central nervous uh, overview is CNS and PNS. PNS we've covered extensively in our previous lectures with autonomic being our target. However, this lecture is a part of the central nervous system on how brain and spinal cord respond to various pharmacology. What is the central nervous system? It has to do with the brain and spinal cord. We mentioned balance of various neurotransmitters would elicit various actions, unlike the peripheral autonomic nervous system, where there's only two acetylcholine and norepinephrine that determine the action. So, like we said, CNS, much more complicated, right? The movement of the body and the behavioral patterns of mind are significant features of CNS. So, it's either going to be movement or it's going to be behavior that we will discuss and we have in the past for such as neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, psychosis, bipolar, mania. All of these have been discussed. Convulsions were the last lecture. Anxiety, depression, and hypnosis have also been discussed. And again, this is the last lecture of the CNS subseries of dental pharmacology. And the solutions to these variations in neurotransmitters that lead to issues such as, say, dependencies or the stimulations of the central nervous system. It is done by balancing neurotransmission by excitation versus inhibition action. So as we always say at the Tooth Factory, our job is to master the concepts, the basic concepts by which the CNS behaves. And that way, understanding the drugs seem much easier. So the central nervous system stimulants will be divided specifically into psychomotor stimulants and hallucinogens. Now, how are they primarily responsible for CNS stimulation? Well, the drugs that are associated to produce psychomotor stimulation their effects may include excitation, euphoria, decrease feeling of fatigue, and increase motor activity. Now keep this in mind, psychomotor, this is the psycho part and that's the motor part, whereas hallucinogens are with mood and behavior. They do have, however, little effect on the spinal cord or the brain stem, which has to do with motor activity. So when it comes to hallucinogens, the effects may include induced, altered, perceptual dreams, which means what we see is real, is how we feel it. The vision changes the bright colors, vivid shapes, all of this becomes real to us. Those drugs, the hallucinogens, could include LSD and THC. Very commonly heard of, LSD is lysergic acid diethylamide, and THC is tetrahydrocannabinol, which is marijuana in other words. Now, the part two of this lecture has to do with drug abuse. We will talk about this. It is heavy. However, it's very short in terms of length. So it should be very quick. The CNS depressants are also 
such as opioids, are also in the group of drug abuse. However, this lecture is primarily on the stimulation of the CN. Classifying the CN as stimulants. The drugs from this group are heavily contributing to the drug of abuse that are discussed later. Now, what we've done is we've divided all of these drugs into separate categories that are easy to remember. So for example, we got coffee, tea, and smoke derivatives. We got caffeine, nicotine, and theophylline. We know caffeine from coffee, we know nicotine from smoke, but did we know that theophylline is derived from tea? So yes, there is an addiction, a dependency, and a CNS stimulant factor of coffee, tea, and smoke. Right, it wakes us up in the morning where it brings us back to speed. Speaking of speed, we have recreational drugs that kind of up our mental alertness. It makes us even more aware of our surroundings and so-called gives us a high in recreation drugs such as cocaine, amphetamine, or methamphetamine, and its other derivative. So all of these are the party drugs. Now we have ADHD and narcolepsy. Now this is not something that's recreation. This is something that's used in treatment. ADHD is a attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's when people have a, a short attention span. So a short attention span means that child or the adult suffering from ADHD or narcolepsy has to regain focus on the particular task they were doing. And that brings us to methylphenidate or dexmethylphenidate. Now just a little tip. A lot of students, specifically medical or law students, tend to consume methylphenidate when studying because it increases the focus on a very, very specific task. Other adjuncts that are also used uh, are also listed in the list here. However, these are not important for us to discuss in our curriculum. However, they still exist, so we put them in the classification. Okay, so let's discuss the classification of the CNS stimulants one by one. We've now come across the names, but let's figure out what their groups are chemically, as well as their subgroup drugs, and where they're derived from, and a fun fact about them. So, a word, methylxanthines. Methylxanthines include theophylline, theobromine, and caffeine. So you must have already guessed it. We're talking about tea with theophylline. Coca, which is the chocolate powder is theobromine. And espressos, cola drinks, candies, energy drinks, as well as coffee, just regular coffee, will give us caffeine. All of these, all they will do is increase the stimulation of CNS. Then comes nicotine. Nicotine, also we're aware of, is an additive ingredient to tobacco. It's not the only harmful chemical in tobacco but it is one of the most addictive ones. It is the second most abused drug after alcohol. So this is to be noted, alcohol is, yes, it is a chemical. However, you know, eth okay, so alcohol is ethanol. We all know that. However, it's still considered a drug that is the world's number one in its addiction capacity, guys. So nicotine, is second. Alcohol is number one. Combination with tar and carbon monoxide leads to the CVS and respiratory diseases as well as cancers like the lung cancer or jaw cancer. That's nicotine. Cocaine. It's a drug of abuse for sure recreationally. Highly highly addictive and it's a schedule 2 drug. Remember the pyramid in the initial slides? That's where this comes into importance. It gives temporary relief to severe depression, not because it treats or cures depression, it just takes us away from depression. Ticking time bomb. Now, why do they call this a ticking time bomb? Now, remember, cocaine is also a part of the local anesthesia classification, right? Well, it is the only local anesthesia which acts as a vasoconstrictor itself, right? The reason why we add, uh, you know, epinephrine or levonorepine to a local anesthesia uh, solution is because we want vasoconstriction. However, cocaine itself is a vasoconstrictor, and it's called a ticking time bomb because it can set off cardiac arrest or congestive heart failure at any given time in its use. 
So keep that in mind, you guys. And then moving on to the amphetamines. We have amphetamines or dextroamphetamines, methamphetamines, MDMA for short. That's the street word for these, the, this group of drugs. So it has similar effects as cocaine. The common names are speed and ecstasy. Now, let me clarify this. It says similar effects as cocaine and the name is speed. The word we're looking for, you guys, is sympathetic activation. Okay, that's the term we need to use for dental pharmacology. Sympathetic activation. What does that mean? So if we look at from our lecture in the sympathetic nervous system, the adrenergic nervous system, we know that anything that activates the sympathetic nervous system increases the CVS effect. That's where it's similar to cocaine. It's a ticking time bomb. It will increase the heart rate, increase the cardiac output. The arrhythmias will go up and down all over the place, causing it to sound like, well, speed. And ecstasy is the other common blue pill, right, from the parties. Don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it holds both the stimulant and hallucinogenic effect. So amphetamines, dangerous. Very well used again. Like we said, these are very, very commonly used. And then come methylphenidate. Methylphenidates are the ones that we talked about for the students giving exams. It is a Schedule II drug. It is addictive because of its increase in focus action. However, it's used in the treatment of ADHD, commonly known for well, meth. So methylxanthines. Let's take a look at all of these in the pharma aspects, the pharmacological aspects the theophylline, theobromine, and the caffeine. What's their mechanism of action? Well, there's three. There's inhibition of phosphodiesterase enzyme. That's number one. Number two, it blocks adenosine receptors. That's number two. And it causes translocation of calcium. As an effect, the therapeutic actions will increase the CNS and the CVS effects, increases mental alertness, and decreases fatigue, makes you euphoric. CBS-wise, it increases inotropic and chronotropic effects by increasing contractility of the heart. It races the heart, hence the translocation of calcium. In the kidneys, it causes mild diuresis, so nothing severe. In the GI tract, it increases HCL production, therefore it is susceptible to peptic ulcers. Therapeutic uses, when do we want to use this methylxanthine group of drugs when we want to have a relaxed smooth muscles of bronchioles. So remember theophylline is used as a treatment modality in asthma. That's where theophylline is from. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors and that eternally relaxes the smooth muscles of bronchioles. The treatment of asthma, however now replaced with a newer upgraded version and pain management when used in Tylenol. Pharmacokinetics. The drugs cross the blood-brain barrier and placenta. They're secreted through the breast and milk as well, so very, very dangerous when it comes to giving it to a new mother. And metabolized by CYP1A2 in the liver, so it's a P450 family. And excreted through urine. Now, for people who don't know what this is, please check out our pharmacodynamics and kinetics lectures. We have very, very extensively talked about the liver enzymes in that lecture. The adverse effects of methylxanthines are anxiety, tremor, withdrawal leads to sedation and fatigue. Basically, what we were trying to avoid is what it causes. It's very harmful to angina patients for obvious reasons that it ups the CVS game because it causes tachycardia. It leads to hyponatremia and hypokalemia because of the diuretic effects. And then it propagates peptic ulcers that we just talked about due to the GI tract. So again, remember when we always talk about adding up to our equations in our lectures? Well, think of it. This is the mechanism. This is what it causes in its signs and symptoms, basically, right, the actions. And that's what leads to its side effects. So let's add up the equations in the following drugs as well, you guys. Nicotine. Mechanism of action is it's a ganglionic stimulation at nicotine receptors with low doses itself. Well, remember, when we used to talk about the synapse, we used to talk about CNS, 
that brings out its neurotransmitters and reaches a ganglion and then moves out and then causes effect at target tissues. Well, remember, all ganglions were known as nicotinic ganglion and ACH would follow attached to the ganglion because it's a nicotinic, right, cholinergic receptor. And then, of course, any either epinephrine or, say, acetylcholine, anything would go to target tissue and cause an effect. So if nicotine is used, the nicotinic receptors are going to be excessively stimulated with low doses. So ganglionic blockade at high doses. Now imagine if you overstimulated something. It would cause lack of effect, right? So in other words, if we think about it, the ganglions are known as nicotines. If nicotine comes to it at even low doses, it will stimulate a lot of that receptor. However, if you keep applying nicotine to that receptor, it will get so excited that it will paralyze itself and there will be no effect at the ganglion. That's this concept. Ganglionic stimulation at low doses and ganglionic blockade as high doses. And therapeutic actions on the central nervous system leads to euphoria, arousal, relaxation at low doses. That's where smoking comes into play. It relaxes the users and it improves attention. Others, such as GI, it appetites and suppresses, where it leads to weight loss. So all smokers are susceptible to weight loss and the suppression of the CVS, respiratory, and CNS at high doses. Now remember, it blocks the ganglions at high doses. Therefore, any system in its pathway, it will block. Another thing about uh, smoking and nicotine is that smoking leads to vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction is a sign of CVS increase. Remember that. This is all at low doses though, because at high doses, CVS, respiratory, and CNS will be blocked. It suppresses them, as well as the GI tract. So, therapeutic uses. It's not of any clinical use, you guys. It's a drug of addiction. It needs to be avoided to prevent physical dependency. However, in pharmacokinetics, it's important to know that it's highly lipid soluble. It will cross blood brain barrier. It will cross placenta and breast milk, right? So not really good for anybody else, especially when women are pregnant or lactating. Smoking means one to two milligrams of nicotine per cigarette and lethal doses at 60. Now, I know it doesn't sound like that, it's too close to a number, but that's only 30 cigarettes away. So that's very dangerous. Adverse effects. Again, equation, right? What the therapeutic actions are and what the adverse effects are, basically overuse of those actions. So it causes dependency, weight loss because of appetite suppression, central respiratory paralysis and medullary paralysis. That's CNS paralysis. Hypotension crisis, CVS paralysis, basically. Intestinal cramps, irritability, tremors, diarrhea, increased BP and heart rate, insomnia, anxiety, and of course, withdrawal issues. This picture here shows that low doses of nicotine will cause arousal and relaxation, whereas high doses of nicotine will cause respiratory paralysis. All right, moving on to cocaine. Cocaine's mechanism is the blockade of reuptake of monoamines, such as norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. So that's one. What it's trying to say here is that in the synapse, this is presynaptic and postsynaptic, all the neurotransmitters are floating in the space here. When they get in here, and of course they cause effects in the postsynaptic terminal, there are some unused norepinephrines and dopamines and so on that usually go back into presynaptic membrane. But what will cocaine do? It'll prevent that. It will make sure that even if these are excess, they end up into the postsynaptic membrane. That's what blockade of reuptake means. And number two is that it increases synaptic concentration of 
all of these, the norepinephrine dopamine, leading to prolonged dopamine action, causing increase in pleasure. So yeah, cocaine causes increase in norepinephrine at the synapse as well as dopamine at the synapse. Now remember from our previous lectures that norepinephrine, when it increases, it causes CVS increase, right? Heart rate goes up, your uh, arrhythmia starts kicking in, as well as dopamine when it goes up, it's about the behavior. It makes our mood better. It makes us happy. It's a pleasure hormone, right? It's a pleasure neurotransmitter. So when there is an increase in synaptic concentration of these two, what can we expect? We can expect us to get pleasure, and that's cocaine. So CNS effects, the therapeutic actions are euphoria, arousal, as well as relaxation due to prolonged dopamine activity in the limbic system. Limbic means emotional. Remember in our earlier lectures, we spoke about a term called as mesolimbic lobe. And that has to deal with feelings. And it increases that. It relaxes and makes it so much better. It increases the happiness, the euphoria. And therapeutic uses. Not clinical use. Avoid it due to dependency, you guys. There is no clinical use for cocaine. Well, until it was used in Coca-Cola and it tastes really nice, but now it's banned. So, okay, just kidding, guys. Coca-Cola does not have cocaine anymore. But at one point it used to. Okay, pharmacokinetics. Highly lipid-soluble crosses the blood-brain barrier, placenta, and in lactation patients. So avoid, 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 no matter what. Adverse effects, dependency. Chronic use can cause dopamine depletion because we are producing a surreal amount of dopamine at the postsynaptic membrane. And now, as soon as you stop using it or use it too long, you become tolerant to the use. It triggers the craving of cocaine even more, which had once increased the dopamine. So dopamine decreased will lead to a craving of cocaine. Cardiac arrhythmia, like we said about the central nervous system's uh, sympathetic system that in turn increases the heart activity. And of course, cardiac arrest has been noted. That's why we call it the ticking time bomb. Okay, so this is just a, a trajectory of, uh, of a series of events that take place when cocaine starts to act adversely. Let me just take the time to explain this chart here. This is from our resources, Lippincott, where it says that your presynaptic vessels, basically a neuron gets a signal and a vesicle would release a neurotransmitter such as norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine into the synaptic cleft from the vesicle and cocaine comes and prevents its reuptake into the cell. So what does that do? It increases the synaptic concentration, leading to an increased response at the postsynaptic membrane. That will, of course, lead to euphoria, a tachycardia, and respiratory rate increase. This is initially. This is when you're partying. It feels good. Heart's racing. Breathing much faster. But later on, it kicks in agitation. It kicks in hypertension and dyspnea, the lack of ability to breathe. And of course, it moves on towards seizures, arrhythmia, and respiratory failure. And of course, we must rest in peace after the excessive consumption of cocaine. Did we notice here that all of these effects had to do with CNS, CVS, and respiratory? So all the, the drugs of abuse, the central nervous stimulations, we are concerned with these three systems mainly. Okay, amphetamines. Amphetamines such as methamphetamine or dextroamphetamine. Their mechanism of action is to increase the release of intracellular catecholamines. Catecholamines are as well as norepinephrine and dopamine and serotonin, which is 5-HT. Uh, it blocks MAO, which is monoamine oxidase. Remember from our previous lecture, the monoamine oxidase is an enzyme that is responsible for the breakdown of all three of these whenever there is a overuse or over concentration of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin in the synaptic cleft. That's what MAO does, but it blocks MAO. 
the catecholamine's reuptake inhibitor, MAO, is blocked. Therefore, the actions are similar to cocaine. What they will do is because it blocks MAO, the norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin concentrations will increase. Guess what that causes? CNS stimulation. Entire CNS, you guys. This one, dangerous drug. It increases alertness, decreases fatigue, depresses appetite, causes insomnia. Great. Just like any other CNS stimulant, right? But look at this. It has an indirect stimulation of adrenergic receptors. It not only prevents the reuptake, it prevents the breakdown of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. So your body keeps feeding it more and more because what happens when you break something down? When MAO breaks down the enzymes, they send a negative feedback. It tells the brain, whoa, 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 let's not send out too many norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. Wait on it. But when it does not break anything down, the body's like, okay, we just need to keep sending more norepinephrine. There is no negative signal. So the body keeps sending more and more and more. Right? So the therapeutic uses, however, and of course, moderation, the doctor, the physician decides the doses, is for attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, narcolepsy, sleep disorder. Narcolepsy, in other words, is a sleep disorder where you fall asleep randomly, and that loses alertness. In your mind, you're, lo you're lost, right? You're in the middle of a meeting, and you fall asleep. You're in the middle of a bus ride, and you fall asleep. That's where the contraindications come into play, is where hypertension or a CVS disease patient, we should not be using the amphetamines. Hyperthyroidism, again, due to a chance of increase in blood pressure. Glaucoma and mal history of drug of abuse. We should not be using the amphetamines. The adverse effects, dependency, weight loss, high doses can cause psychosis and convulsions. It can become tolerant. We are able to become tolerant, causes tremors, dizziness, and derillium. It increases the heart activity, arrhythmia, tachycardia, diarrhea, and anorexia is also possible. Okay, let's talk about how the references talk about CNS stimulation and its mechanism with cocaine and amphetamine. So we know that when there is no drug taken, a presynaptic neuron, when it receives the signal, it will tell the vesicles to release hormones or neurotransmitters such as serotonin. Serotonin is apparently said to give us happy feelings. But when there's too much of it, our body says, hey, no, 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 let's go back. Let's go back home. There's too many out here, right? And that's what happens. Or serotonin breaks down by mouth, monoamine oxidase. But when we take cocaine and amphetamines, the cocaine will prevent the reuptake. The amphetamines will prevent the mouth from breaking it down, causing an increase in serotonin in the synapse. So the acute effect is basically all of this serotonin will be increase in concentration because the amphetamines, the MDMA, methyl amphetamines, will prevent the reuptake of serotonin and breakdown due to the blockage of mouse. So MDMA causes serotonin release into the synapse. It inhibits the synthesis and blocks its reuptake. The effects are increased serotonin concentration in the synaptic cleft and a depletion of intracellular serotonin stores occur. So what do we know for sure? That it prevents synthesis of new serotonin and it prevents the reuptake of existing. Now methylphenidate. Methylphenidate or dexmethylphenidate, their mechanism of action is dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. And we've just talked about this in depth, which means it, we, it's easy to understand that it increases both dopamine and norepinephrine in the synapse. The therapeutic actions are used for ADHD children that lack dopamine signals. And methylphenidate will increase dopamine in the synapse as a compensation mechanism. It causes alertness to increase in the brain. The therapeutic uses are attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, 
narcolepsy, which is when you sleep at any given time randomly without notice. Pharmacokinetics. It enters the brain much slowly. This is methylphenidate we're talking about. There is a less risk of dopamine tendency. Right? You don't want to be you don't want to be dependent like amphetamines. Amphetamines were very dangerous in that manner. It inhibits the metabolism of warfarin, phenytoin, phenobarbital, primidone, and TCAs, leading to their toxicity. So this is a liver metabolism effect. Methylphenidates, when taken with all of these drugs, they will prevent the metabolism of all of these drugs. When metabolism of these drugs is prevented, the plasma concentration of these drugs is increased leading to their toxicity. Adverse effects, abdominal pain, nausea, anorexia, insomnia, nervousness and fever, and it's a contraindicated drug in glaucoma. This is the references diagram of how amphetamines work. When there is no amphetamines, the vessels release norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine, and there is, of course, an adequate response. Perfect. However, with amphetamines, there is an increased release of norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine, and it prevents the reuptake of these drugs, of these neurotransmitters, and there's an increased response of an existing response. That's all it means. Okay. These are the side effects of both methylphenidate and amphetamines. We got diarrhea, insomnia, confusion, potential for addiction, the dependency, and nausea, vertigo, and hypertension because of CVS involvement. This is for marijuana side effects, THC. Increase in appetite, it's called the munchies. Impaired coordination, it's when we're confused. Hallucinations, remember we're moving towards hallucinogens now in the following part of the lecture. It can also cause conjunctivitis, tachycardia, and impaired memory. Now we're talking about drug of abuse and classifications. We got stimulants, hallucinogens, and others. Stimulants we talked about. These should now be familiar to us, right, guys? Amphetamine, cocaine, MDMA, cocaine, and as well as bath salts, which are synthetic in, in their nature. Then comes hallucinogens, LSD and marijuana. Other drugs of abuse are ethanol, and of course, prescription drugs such as opioids that we spoke of in the initial part of the lecture. So, illicit drugs, marijuana, psychotherapeutics, and cocaine. They tend to be at the highest of abuse rates. Okay, so this chart represents physical dependency ratios. So for example, the categories of CNS stimulants, caffeine. In terms of addiction, the physical dependency, it's moderate whereas nicotine is the largest of them all. Cocaine and amphetamine, extremely high as well. Hallucinogens such as LSD and THC, they're not really addictive, they just make you feel really, really good, right? For temporary purposes. Then comes CNS depressants. Ethanol, highly addictive, even more than nicotine. So number one is alcohol, number two is nicotine. Benzodiazepines may not have a physical dependency that high, but their counterparts, their other cousin, the barbs, barbiturates, have a very high physical dependency, or chemical dependency for that matter. And narcotics such as morphine, heroin, and as well as if we can add fentanyl to the list, it would be great. All of these have a very high, high physical dependency. This chart just shows what uh, the ratio is in a pie chart where marijuana is the most used illicit drug and of course, the painkillers are the next. If we know anything about uh, House MD, the show, there used to be a drug that was there called Vicodin. Vicodin, Dr. House used to use it, Gregory House. That's a painkiller, and it's an opioid. So very high dependency he had. All right, ethanol. We cannot end a drug of abuse lecture without talking about alcohol. So the general information is colorless, clear hydroxylated hydrocarbon known as alcohol. It's produced from fermentation of fruits, grains, or veggies. For example, with fruits, you're talking about wine. With grains or 
vegetables, you're talking about certain types of beers and gin, right? A uh, major cause of fatal car accidents, drownings, and fatal falls is alcohol. It, it creates a decrease in life expectancy all the way by 10 to 15 years when we consume anything more than this. The mechanism of action, it enhances GABA inhibition. Remember, GABA is already an inhibitory mechanism, a neurotransmitter that inhibits CNS functions, and alcohol enhances that. There is a release of endogenous opioid, as well as it manipulates the serotonin and dopamine. So it messes with your mind in simple language. And uh, psychological and physiological effects are very hand in hand. We have a selective CNS depressant at low doses, whereas it's a general overall CNS depressant at high doses. And of course, coma and death could be due, but only due to respiratory depression. So again, we talked about CNS, CVS, as well as respiratory. This is just a little guide to help us remember what a drink is in under normal circumstances. Women with eight or more drinks a week can be drug of abuse of alcohol or can, call, can be called alcoholism. For men, it's 15 drinks or more per week. This is a chart from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism in the United States of America. Low risk drinking limits are basically for men, you're looking at no more than four drinks on a day, on any day. That's single day. Women, no more than three drinks on a day. Per week, you're looking at 14 for men and seven for women. So if you go 15 per week here, and if you went eight per week here, then you're entering alcoholism. So to stay low risk, keep within both the single day and the weekly limits. This can be a question on a test, you guys. Okay, pharmacokinetics of alcohol or ethanol. Commonly, it's oral consumption. Then there's inhalation as well. Food will slow down the absorption and the peak ethanol levels in our CNS depression will take place at 20 to 60 minutes as it metabolizes in the liver in a two-step mechanism, one here and one here, where alcohol dehydrogenase will break down the actual ethanol and converts it to acetaldehyde, where it further metabolizes in the liver itself by aldehyde dehydrogenase into acetate. So what we're looking at is ethanol turning into acetaldehyde, turning into acetate. It's a zero order elimination. Basically, it just leaves the kidney as it comes and it's eliminated in the kidney. The chronic ethanol effects include profound hepatic, CVS, pulmonary, hematologic, endocrine, metabolic, and CNS damage. And we don't call it number one for no reason, right? Ethanol's sudden cessation effects. So if you stopped ethanol suddenly, after becoming an alcoholic, you can expect tachycardia, sweating, tremor, anxiety, hallucinations, and convulsions. Alcohol withdrawal symptoms in other way. So chronic effects of alcohol abuse, there's degenerative changes in the brain. There's myopathy, which is muscle necrosis in the body, which is very bad and very painful. There's pancreatitis. There's cardiomyopathy, which means it creates arrhythmia, tachycardia, heart disease. And of course, we have fatty liver and alcoholic hepatitis and cirrhosis, which is also known as alcoholic liver, by the way, in its most impaired form. Impaired absorption in the small intestines. And of course, in men, it can lead to testicular atrophy and infertil infertility in females. Fetal alcohol syndrome is very, very devastating when it comes to fetus development and spontaneous abortion can also happen. All right, treatment of alcohol dependence. If in case there is a chance of alcohol dependence, how do we treat it? We use disulfiram for it. Why? Well, because it blocks the oxidation of acetaldehyde to acetic acid. 
by inhibiting the dehydrogenase enzyme and therefore acetaldehyde will increase in the plasma concentrations. Why do we want that to happen? Why do we not want ethanol to go into acetaldehyde to go into acetate? That's the normal metabolism, right? Well, when it comes to alcohol dependence, our job is to let the patient know how bad this drug is. So what we're going to do is we're going to metabolize ethanol halfway through, but then we're going to use disulfiram to block the second half from acetaldehyde to acetic acid. Disulfiram will cause accumulation of a lot of acetaldehyde. It will result in the following effects. Flushing, tachycardia, hyperventilation, and nausea. Right? That's what it causes. When acetaldehyde is excessively increased in the blood concentration, it leads to flushing, tachycardia, hyperventilation, and nausea. This is known as disulfiram-like effect. This is where people do not use alcohol while taking disulfiram, so they would avoid these adverse effects. So you want to give them a little break from all of these side effects. Disulfiram will make them essentially have a red face increase heart rate, increase breathing cycles, and causes nausea. That's all around like effect. That's where people avoid taking alcohol whenever they're taking this drug. Naltrexone is another way. It's a long-active acting opioid, not opinion. <laughs> opinion. Sorry, guys. It's my opinion that it's a long-acting opioid antagonist. It's better than disulfiram because it has less adverse effects. And that brings us to the end of the lecture today. Here are resources Lippincott and Litton Phallus that we use to create this lecture. The links are in the description box below. And for any further information, any requests, please reach out to us in the comment box below so we can help you out with anything that you need academically. The Tooth Factory is always here. And we really, really, really appreciate your support. So please like, share, and subscribe so we can help many more dental students out in the world. Thank you very much. Have a great day.